Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking. So, For Honor has quickly become my favorite video game. The gameplay is brilliant, the war is epic. All in all is an intriguing video game with some RPG features, an intriguing hack and slash combat system based on actual medieval stances and some MOBA elements to it. Now all of this of course might sound like a mouthful, but the game freaking nails it. On this video we will take the For Honor heroes we like so much and imagine them taking part to a real battle in our world. And we shall answer the question, who among all For Honor heroes would be the strongest in real life? So I'm going to make a list from the weakest hero to the strongest one. And this list will not be based on my personal preference. I'll try to be as unbiased as I can. But it will be based on my personal understanding of historical military warfare, taking into consideration real-life Vikings, knights from the 12th century to the 15th, imperial Romans of the times of the Principate, and samurai warriors of Muromachi and Sengoku era, respectively. As that is pretty much when and where all these characters are inspired from, and we shall examine in details the sort of equipment these warriors use. Moreover, talking about the equipment, so the weapons and armor featured in the game, I will only consider the basic gear they have, as if I had to consider all possible drops, heroic gear, legendary, this video would never end. Also, please remember that this list is based upon my humble opinion. If you don't agree with it, I would be glad to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And thank you for taking the time to watch my content. I hope you'll find it entertaining. Number 18. The Shaman. Although this character is permeated with a mystical aura which I suppose makes her interesting, she would surely lack efficacy on a real medieval battlefield. She wears no helmet, her head is completely unprotected and she wears virtually no armour, save it for a few patches of leather and shoulder guards, but the very centre of her torso is not defended. She wields a hatchet and a knife the latter held in the ice pick grip, both weapons of short range, the ice pick grip further reducing the range of motion of her arm in favour of penetrative power. But since she is dual wielding, she has no shield, which, together with her lack of proper armour and helmet, would mean she would fall, killed by arrows, before she even reaches the front line. Number 17. The Shinobi. Yes, I know, this one will upset some people, but bear with me for a moment. Let's think about it. What was a Shinobi? Shadow warrior? No. Assassin? No. A shinobi is feudal Japanese intelligence. They were spies. Now, even considering the For Honor shinobi in the For Honor universe, who is basically a martial arts master and an assassin, he would be an excellent agent, no doubts about it, but surely not a strong warrior. Kicks do nothing against armor. He's wearing very little armor himself, a sort of small leather jerking which fails to protect the entirety of his abdomen, making disembowelment rather easy to achieve for an actual warrior. Sure, he is quick, but he's using two Kusari Gama as his main weapons, which in reality, not only the Kama absent the chain wasn't a battlefield weapon, but it actually wasn't a weapon at all. It was more of a tool than a weapon, mostly used to break up fences. It was not intended for combat, because it would be a very ineffective choice when compared to any other real battlefield weapon. Number 16. The Berserker. Although he surely looks tougher than a shaman and shinobi, hence his position on this list, on battle the berserker would suffer from the same drawbacks of the other two in terms of lack of head protection, dual wielding short weapons which give him a range disadvantage over other warriors and the lack of a shield which is not compensated by body armour. He does have rather large leather spaulders which at least offer better protection than those of the shaman, but again the centre of the torso where all the vital organs are is exposed and unprotected, leading to certain death on the battlefield. Number 15. The Aramusha. Being a Saka for ancient Japan, I was very happy with the Aramusha, the stereotypical image of a badass Ronin of feudal Japan. But even if his skill with the sword were that of a legend, differently from what anime teaches us, you cannot cut through metal armor with a sword. And that includes the katana, believe it or not. The katana was not a main battlefield weapon in feudal Japan. Pole weapons and bows were. The katana was only a backup weapon. The fact he dual wields is not unheard of in Japanese kenjutsu if we consider Miyamoto Musashi's own style, Nitoryu. But Miyamoto's style dual wielding would assume a katana and a wakizashi, so one long, one short. Dual wielding two katana as the Aramusha chooses to do would be possible, of course, but it would be harder. 
and two weapons of the same length could easily obstruct each other or get in the way. In terms of armour, the Aramusha only has a wooden cuirass and his head is basically unprotected as his cool looking hat will be split open by any battlefield weapon. And although his legs are protected by a form of suneate or greaves under which we can see a pair of kyahan or traditional wrappings for comfort, his arms are completely exposed and the hands are no secondary target in combat. If they open a wound on your hand, you won't be able to operate your weapon anymore, becoming a useless warrior and finding your doom. The only reason the Aramusha is above the Berserker on this list is his slight range advantage and his torso being protected. Number 14. The Peacekeeper. You will have noticed a certain pattern on this video, I am definitely penalizing dual wielders and history tells us why. Jewel wielding is a viable option in historical jewels. It was done both in northern Italian sword styles such as the Bolognese style and as I said before in Japanese Nitoryu and it was done by the Roman gladiator class the Machaerus. But dual wielding was never done in war for the previously mentioned reasons. Of all the dual wielders in For Honor, however, the peacekeeper would be the strongest one because she is dual wielding a long and a short sword, presents a better opportunity for attack and defense, and a range advantage over other dual wielders in the game, exception being the Aramusha. But what really makes her stand stronger than the Aramusha is her metal armor components, even if sparse, and most importantly, her metal helmet. Number 13, the Nobushi. One thing the Nobushi gets right is the weapon. She wields a spear, the most common battlefield weapon in the ancient world all the way up to the Middle Ages. Spears are great because they give you the best range advantage you can get before starting to consider bows and other ranged weapons of such. You can pierce with it, you can cut with it. It's a versatile weapon which can compensate for lack of strength. On the armor department, however, she's wearing basically nothing apart from a piece of sode or spolder. That's what penalized her as far as I'm concerned. If she had armor, I would have given her a higher position. Number 12, the Shugoki. Okay, don't get me wrong, I own a Kanabo. It's a wonderful weapon and on this list, up to now, after the spear, it's the very first actual battlefield weapon we encounter. So in the weapon department, this man finally holds something reasonable. But as every martial artist or athlete worth his salt will tell you, even if he does have a certain mass to him, and I would imagine definitely reasonable strength, being extremely overweight to this extent is a massive problem. By the looks of it, this guy just doesn't train. Because if it did, I doubt it would look the way he does. He will surely lack the stamina needed to march, run and fight effectively on the battlefield. In terms of armour, his torso is protected, although keep in mind this faction only uses wood for armour. A Roman shield already can weigh 8 kg and it's plywood. That thickness of wooden planks would weigh more than the equivalent in 18 gauge steel the actual samurai used in real warfare, unless the planks are thinner than they look. But for the sake of this video, let's consider the kind of wood they use in For Honor, or in the For Honor universe, is light and resistant at the same time to justify such armor. Still, the Shigoki has all his limbs unprotected, and only the face has some protection, leaving the rest of the head exposed to receiving trauma. Number 11. The Highlander. The Highlander in For Honor universe is a strong Scottish-inspired warrior who wields a massive greatsword. The weapon itself is a late medieval claymore, having a cross hilt of forward slopping quillens with quarterfoil termination. The weapon is fine. It was historically used all the way up to the Battle of Killicranky in 1689. It gives you a range advantage, and although it would be heavier than smaller swords, the real examples of claymores can be moved around rather quickly, as contrary to popular belief. A typical claymore wouldn't weigh more than 2.5 kilograms or 5.5 pounds. He's wearing body armor, what appears to be a sort of leather scale cuirass. Of course it wouldn't be as effective as metal armor, but if we imagine it to be something similar to cuirbouli, then it could still be a viable type of armor, and surely better than wearing nothing. The lack of a helmet and hand protection are the only negative aspects of his equipment, as his arms do have protection, but at least he's wearing some thick looking heavy boots. Top 10. Number 10. The Raider. The Raider is definitely in the top 10. The massive Dane axe he is wielding would make for a fearsome weapon, which would again grant him an advantage of range over some of his opponents, and his strength would make him into an enemy to be feared. The only reason he lost top 3 position in my book is the fact he fights with a naked torso. 
The reason he still made it in front of the Highlander, regardless of the fact that the Highlander does have body armor, is because at least the Raider has a helmet, and a good one at that, since it's metal. Also, the fact that he at least has thick leather spaulders, and on one side of his thigh has some form of armor, and his hands have some protection, gave him access to the top 10, overtaking the Highlander. Number 9. The Orochi. I know in the game the Orochi is an assassin class, so a light and swift warrior, but he still is in full samurai regalia. So for me, that's a big thumbs up. Full battle armor, and you are on the top 10. The choice of weapon, however, doesn't allow him to go higher. Sure, the katana is a fine blade, but as I said, it was a backup weapon, not a main battlefield weapon. The reason why the Orochi has a higher place than a raider is, of course, his armor, but also the fact that a bladed weapon would be a perfect choice against an opponent without armor. Yes, the raider is a tough and strong guy, but he can still be cut open by the Orochi's katana, even if the Orochi doesn't place the perfect cut. On the other hand, the raider would need a well-placed hit to split the Orochi's armors open, still giving some reasonable properties to the wood of the For Honor universe, as a side swipe might not deal the damage needed to incapacitate a fully armored opponent. Number 8. The Gladiator. It was difficult to decide position of the list between the Orochi and the Gladiator. The Gladiator in For Honor is a mix between a historical Oplomachus, the Roman Gladiator with spear and a small round shield, and the Retiarius, the Roman Gladiator wielding the trident and a net. Clearly he suffers from the same problem of the Raider in terms of lack of body armor and exposed torso. But what gives him a higher position on my list is the fact that although small, he has a shield, so he can in a way compensate in his defense lack. So he can in a way compensate in his defense department. He maintains range advantage over the Orochi, and the helmet, spaulders, full right manica, and greaves are all made of metal, granting him superior protection over the previous warriors on this list. His belt around his loins also seems to be made of metal, giving at least partial protection to his lower abdomen. The trident as a weapon is a rather poor one at that, and his spear would be a better choice. So ultimately, he does have the placement he has because of his superior armor components and the presence of a shield and closed helmet. Number seven, the Valkyrie. The Valkyrie has a very good weapon combination, a shield and a spear. She has good defense, range advantage, and the spear will allow her to wound her opponents from safety distance, compensating to any misjudgment defending with her shield. Her head is fully protected by a metal helmet and she is wearing a full leather body armor which also provides complete protection of her shins and forearms. She scores higher than the gladiator because more parts of her body are protected and the spear is longer and more efficient than the trident for combat. If the gladiator's torso were protected in metal armor, he would have had an advantage in my book, but they did follow Roman gladiatorial tradition in that respect. Number 6. The Centurion. Although I prefer the segmentata version, his standard equipment is a muscolata armor. In terms of body armor and protection, he is, up to now, the best geared warrior. He's wearing full metal body armor, he has a helmet with full protection, and all his limbs also have protection, so fighting this guy without having armor on your own is probably going to be suicide. The only problem with the Centurion in For Honor is his weapon, which is the reason why he doesn't go further up on this list. The Roman Gladius. Of course, differently from the katana, the Roman gladius was a main battlefield weapon, and for quite a long time. So how can it be that here on this list it scores lower than other weapons? Because the centurion is not using a scutum, no shield. The effectiveness of the historical gladius as a battlefield weapon, again historically speaking, is all due to its usage in combination with a large shield. Without the shield, the gladius suffers from similar fate of other bladed weapons, plus the problem of being shorter. So although his superior armor gave him the sixth place of this list, so higher even than warriors with better weapons, his gladius, without a scutum, won't allow him to enter the top five. Top five. Number five. The Kensei. Here we have another samurai in full battle regalia. There is one obvious main difference between the Kensei and the Orochi, which in my opinion would greatly favor the Kensei, apart from the fact he looks generally physically stronger, his Nodachi. The Nodachi was a battlefield weapon, it was used by the samurai class mostly to contrast enemy cavalry, but Japanese Genjutsu schools which focus on the Nodachi usage, such as Enshin Ryu and Jigen Ryu, all use it in a similar way to a katana. 
An Odachi gives you a range advantage, similar to that of a spear, although not quite, but the extra mass on its blade favours penetration of lightly armoured opponents, or at least gives it extra impact force. If the Kensei weren't in full armour, I would have put him behind the Highlander, as I believe a Claymore to be an overall better sword than an Odachi. But in combination with full samurai armour, we now have a well-defended warrior who also benefits of range, which grants him position 5. Number 4. The Warlord. The Warlord is in my opinion one of the best warriors in the game. He has a big round viking shield and I'm happy to say they got the grip right, although some linen on it would have been nice to see. Viking shields were often of a more sophisticated construction than the typical naked wooden planks we see on games and TV shows, but the shield still looks sturdy for battle and has a strong looking iron rim to it. He wears a metal helmet and has a complete leather body armour. His shield will be good against arrows and it's bigger than those of the Gladiator and the Valkyrie, providing more overall coverage. He's wielding a one-handed sword, clearly inspired from Viking Age swords, which in combination with the shield can be a reasonable choice against enemies who are not wearing metal armour. The only reason he has a higher position than the Centurion, who actually wears better armour, is again the presence of the shield and the slight range advantage over him. While against the Kensei, he would have, yes, a range disadvantage, but the metal helmet, remember, the Kensei is wearing wood, and the round shield would most likely compensate for that. Number 3. The Conqueror. As you can already tell, the Knight Faction gets the podium on my list. While number 1 was an obvious choice for me, choosing between number 2 and number 3 was really difficult. The Conqueror is a knight wearing full armour. I'm not sure if he's wearing mail underneath that, but I'm pretty sure he's wearing a coat of plates, that's what it looks like. He also has a primitive great helm, metal spaulders, and all his limbs are protected with metal armour. He also wears a sturdy heater shield, which makes him into a very accurate battlefield warrior from his historical point of view. His weapon is what ultimately gave him number 3 in the podium instead of number 2. He's using a flail, a weapon with a chain and a round metal striking head. You see, 200 flails were deployed in Germany and Central Europe in the late Middle Ages, although they were rather rare and not used by noble knights, mind you. But the smaller 100 flail was even less common. It appears occasionally in artwork from the 15th century, but many historians have expressed doubts that it ever saw use as an actual military weapon. The weapon could be used to bypass and go around a shield, and its blunt force might have some value, but it lacks precision. And the fact that historically it was rare is already a message of its lack of real effectiveness. Shields and metal armor is what got the conqueror this far. Number two. The Warden. A fully armoured knight was a powerful opponent. The Warden is wearing full male armour and then he has plate arms and legs giving him excellent protection. He also has a full helmet protecting his head which has a sugar loaf top, differently from the Conqueror, which helps with weapon deflection. If For Honor occurred in real life with these warriors using these kinds of equipment, the Warden would slaughter all the rest of the warriors on this list apart from number one, assuming equal skill. The longsword against the conqueror who is in full armour would not be a good choice because you can't cut through metal armour, but the possibility to have sword with it, which we actually see him do in the game, holding the sword from the blade, transforming it into an improvised blunt weapon, would allow him to overpower the conqueror in my book. Number one, the Lawbringer. To me, it's him, no doubt. The Lawbringer has all the advantages. He's wearing full plate armour and has a technological gap even to the rest of the knights of his faction of around two centuries, 200 years. His armour looks inspired from a late 15th century harness and the game lore tells us that only their order holds the secrets to the making of such armour, which probably also means it's a different quality of steel, possibly medium carbon steel versus mild steel of the rest of the faction. Although in the game you see warriors wielding bladed weapons dealing damage to the Lawbringer, in reality he will be invulnerable to all sorts of cuts and most piercing, and only the Conqueror the wooden half-sorting or the shugoki could potentially hurt him. But against all these, the Lawbringer has a range advantage, as he is wielding a polearm and probably the most effective weapon of them all. The weapon can cut, can pierce and has blunt force on the rear side. As if this wasn't enough, he's also a freaking giant. He's the tallest, strongest and most muscular warrior in the game, towering even over the raider, making him into a warrior none of the others could ever dream to take on. Again, 
assuming equals skill. Okay, number ones, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Please let me know who is your favorite For Honor warrior. Let me know in the comments below. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.